Hannah, and I... <laughs> Hi, friends. Uh, my name is Hannah, and I am the preaching resident here at First Temple, which means that I am part of a team that shares the responsibility of preaching every Sunday morning. And it is an absolute blast to be a part of that team, and it's a joy to be a part of your church, too. Um, so if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet... Uh, would you make it a point that uh, today, after our service, you will come and shake my hands and let me know who you are. I really want to get to know your names and your faces. I also want to welcome our friends who are joining online. We see you and we're so glad that you're here too. We're in the middle of a series right now called The Intersection. The Intersection of Heaven and Earth. We're thinking about what the significance is of us being here as the people of God. What's important about what we're doing here together? Because you can look around the world, you can scroll through social media or turn on the news, and there's like all sorts of like opinions out there, right? There's all sorts of like bad news and negative things and everybody's got a really strong opinion about everything and it just gets a little ugly and a little tense sometimes, right? So like, why, what's the point of us being here? I mean, all of this is going on outside and yet we're here. And I think part of the reason that we're here is because you and I, whether we know it or not, think that things could be better, right? Like we serve a God that we trust and we have hope because we know that this God is making all things new, setting all things right. That the negativity and the grossness of the world that we feel sometimes isn't the final word. And we get to participate in what it means to make things right. To do things better. That's the joy and part of the beauty of being here together. We are the intersection of heaven and the mess of things on earth. We should be different out there because of how we live and what we do in here. That's what being the intersection is all about. And as we think about what this means, we've identified five different characteristics of what being the intersection might look like. Love, loving one another bearing burdens with each other, doing life together, living in peace or in harmony with each other, practicing hospitality, practicing humility. These are the things that when the world is scrolling and then they see us, they should stop and notice something different about us. And it's these things. Love, bearing burdens, living in harmony, hospitality, humility. And we get this from Romans chapter 12. We're going to read that together. It's on our church app if you want to pull it up there. If you also have a copy, I'd love for you to follow along with me. Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 9 this morning. Romans 12 starting in verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal or passion, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited, 
Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So if you didn't pick up on it yet, today we're going to be talking about peace and harmony. We're going to be focused on this characteristic of what it means to be a people of peace, a people of harmony that verse 16 and verse 18 tell us that we're supposed to be. And I think sometimes when we hear that word peace, when we hear that this is the type of people we're supposed to be, we have very strong reactions. I think we immediately jump into one extreme or the other. And I really heavily identify with like one of these extremes, okay? Because I hear, live at peace with one another. And I think, hold on though, hold on. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> I have a lot of things that I care very deeply about. Like, I've done my research, I've educated myself, the things that I care about, the things that I stand up for, those are important to me. And when you say live at peace with everyone, it kind of makes it sound like I have to give up those things. Like, it sounds a little too much like you want me to link arms and, like, skip through the woods with people. Kind of not my deal. Have any of you in here taken a personality test before? Any types of these? For one reason or another, I've ended up taking like all of them. So, you know, you've got like the Enneagram and the DISC and the MBTI and the ABCDFGs and like all of the tests, okay? <laughs> and they all have told, told me like some variation of the same thing. They've been like, Hannah, you're super passionate. You like to advocate for people. You're opinionated. You have a strong sense of right and wrong. And I'm like, yeah, I do. I do. And my in-laws had to learn that the hard way. See, because when I first met them, I was like quiet and really kind and just like, and then they decided to play card games. And in that moment, they realized they had made a huge mistake sitting by me because I will destroy. I have opinions and I am not afraid to share them. And it doesn't matter if we've made an alliance, I'm going to win at the end of the day. Like that's, that's just how it goes. I'm sorry. And some of you feel like this too because you hear like verse 9 and you go, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And I'm like, Yes. And then you hear verse 11, it's like, never be lacking in zeal, never be lacking in passion. And I'm like, oh, yeah. But then I read verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. And verse 18. Live at peace with everyone. And I think, really, God? Are you sure? Because some of these people, they got some dumb opinions. I don't know that I agree with them on that. That's a little too far out there for me. Plus, I really like being right. That's a lot of fun. See, I think sometimes we fail at being people of peace because we think that finding common ground is the only way we can get along. We fail to be people who live in harmony because if we can't see eye to eye, then we're not going to try. I think that's one extreme that we jump to sometimes. But some of you are not like me, thank goodness. 
Some of you fall into this other category where you hear be people of peace, be people of harmony, and you're like, yes, I'm all for it. You are conflict averse. You will do anything to avoid fights or drama or conflict, even sometimes if it comes at the expense of your own thoughts or opinions or agenda. You just like put that on the back burner as long as we have peace. I had a roommate in college who was like this. See, my second semester of college, I lived with two girls. And me and one of the roommates, we really love ice cream. And we always had ice cream in our freezer for one reason or another. And we got in the habit, the three of us, of studying together. And inevitably, while we were studying, me and one of the other ice cream loving roommates, would get up and get us all bowls of ice cream and we would eat ice cream and do homework together. Good stuff, right? Well, about halfway through the semester, our third roommate said, hey, um, could you maybe not give me ice cream anymore tonight? And we're like, okay. And then she goes on to tell us, well, actually, I didn't want to say anything before, because like, I didn't want to cause a problem, but I'm lactose intolerant, <laughs> and this is starting to cause problems for me. <laughs> and we were like, oh. See, she was so ready to avoid conflict, avoid drama, avoid the stress and the hassle and the frustration that came with that, that she was willing to put all of the things that she had prioritized in her life aside, even at the risk and the detriment of her own physical health. That's how much she wanted to be a peaceful person. But I think sometimes it's easy for her to, to live in harmony with one another, to live in peace with one another if you forfeit all of your like personal convictions and the things that are important to you. And in our pursuit of peace, sometimes it's easy to forget that we are called to be people of conviction, to hate what is evil, to cling to what is good, to be people of passion. Sometimes we fail to be people of peace because we think that compromising everything is the only way we can get along. We fail to live in harmony because we think that we have to forget all of the things that matter to us for the sake of peace. Being people of peace, being people of harmony is hard especially when sometimes we immediately jump into these two different extreme camps where you either have to get rid of everything that matters to you or believe that the only thing that matters is your convictions. So how do we do this thing? How do we be people of peace and harmony? What does that even look like? I think we're given a biblical example of what that might look like. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 gives us a glimpse of what it might look like to be a people living in peace and harmony. This is right at the very beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry. And he's trying to decide who's going to be the people that he does life with. He's determining who his crew is. So Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 1, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. And now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first... Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who also betrayed him. 
So we're given this list of the 12 disciples, the 12 guys that Jesus decides he's going to do life and ministry with. And at first glance, there's nothing that really sticks out about any of these guys. It just seems kind of like a random assortment of people. But I think if we dig a little deeper into who they are, something kind of interesting happens. We see something kind of interesting about these group of people. See, four of them are fishermen. Four of them are like this working class people. One of them is a government official, Matthew the tax collector. And he probably was incredibly hated by his community because he worked for a government that wasn't always very nice to people. There's a couple brothers in this group, so some of them are related. Some of them have never even met before. There's another guy who's a political activist, Simon the Zealot. He is called, that word zealot distinguishes him as part of this group of political activists seeking to, like, overthrow the government. And yes, it's the same government that Matthew works for. One of them is really incredibly eager and very opinionated and bold and is very known for putting his foot in his mouth all the time. Can I get an amen from my Peters out there? <laughs> yes, I see you. There's another one, though, who, like, on the other hand, he, he doesn't really say a whole lot. In fact, the Bible doesn't actually record things that he says. One of them is really, really quick to faith to trust in everything that Jesus says. And another one of them is pretty well known for his questions, for his doubts. See, when we look at this group of people, they come from different backgrounds, they have different occupations, different histories, they're in different stages of life, opposite ends of political spectrums, different socioeconomic classes, they couldn't be a more diverse group of people. They have every single reason not to get along. There is no reason that group of people should ever be in the same room doing things together. That's a recipe for disaster. And yet, they have one very important thing in common. Their relationship with Jesus. And through this relationship they have with Jesus, they are able to do remarkable, incredible things. Verse 1 tells us that these people were given authority to perform miracles, to perform healings, these people were given power and authority to do things. These are the people that Jesus walked with and talked with and learned with. These are the people who celebrated and cried with Jesus. This was his crew. <laughs> and when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected and then went and returned to the Father and was no longer walking on earth physically, these are some of the first people that God sent his spirit to. The first people who got to feel the power of the Holy Spirit. And these are the people who are tasked with starting the church. They lay the foundations of the room you're standing in. They are here. We are here because they were there. This diverse group of people who should not have gotten along, who shouldn't have been able to do anything remarkable or incredible, who shouldn't have even been able to get along in the same room together, are the representation of Christ after Christ has gone. They're able to do this because of their relationship with Jesus. And that is our foundation. 
In the same way that they came from all different walks of life and were able to do something incredible because of their relationship with Christ, you and I, who come from all different walks of life, who walked in the room with all different circumstances and all different diverse backgrounds, have one thing very important in common, and it's Christ Jesus. It's our commitment to one another. It is our responsibility now to do what the disciples did, to live in peace and harmony with one another, not because our differences don't matter, but because being belonging to one another and our relationship with Christ has to be more important. It has to be. In these coming months, they're building an apartment complex right next door. They're expecting something like 500 new families to move in. 500 families within walking distance to our front door. But why would anybody out there want to be what we have in here? Is it because we've got our theology all figured out? Because we finally know how to argue the correct way? Because we can tell you how to live your life and what to do and what to think and what to believe and we're good at it? Is it because we follow the right political party or because we have the right thinking? Or is it because we don't care about any of that stuff and so you can just come in here and and sing kumbaya and we'll throw up peace signs and have feel good worship? What is it about us? It has to be our relationship with Christ. It has to be our commitment to one another. It has to be because we are people committed to peace with one another. So how do we do this thing? How do we be people of peace? Well, I think we've actually already read the answer. Verse 10, Romans 12, verse 10 says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And there's a version of that verse that I love that says, outdo showing one another honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. And basically what that means is that instead of being in competition with one another or trying to prove one thing over and above, what if we just loved each other for the joy of doing it? What if we got into competition and started a kindness war with our neighbors? (laughs) It might look something like the next time you're out to eat with a friend and the waiter comes up to you and says, will this be together or separate? You don't have the awkward little like. You just did it. What if you just paid for their food? It might look like showing up for your friends in the big things and also the small things. Don't wait for somebody to be in the hospital or to have lost a loved one to show up in their life, to care about the things that are going on. The midterm election is coming up soon. What if you drove with somebody to go and vote or shared a meal with somebody after you voted without talking about politics? What if it was actually okay to be friends with somebody knowing that their vote might cancel yours out? What if you made it a priority that every single time you came into this building, you didn't leave without meeting one new person? Somebody in a different life stage than you, somebody who attends a different worship venue than you, someone who doesn't look like you or sound like you or have the same background as you, what if you made it a priority to get to know them?
We are the intersection of heaven and earth. A glimpse of something that could be better. Which means we have to be a people committed to peace. Committed to harmony. Committed to one another. Will you close your eyes for just a moment? I'm going to ask you to take just a second and think about one way that you can pursue peace with someone this week. Someone within this church. What would it look like for you to pursue peace with someone? God, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you, God, that you provide a better way. Would you help us to look like you, Jesus? Would you transform our hearts and our minds and be deeply committed to one another? Not because it's easy. but because we desire to look like you. Would you be with us as we go out from this place? And would you give us the courage to be people of peace?